Hey, how's it going everyone? This is Derek Clavin, and welcome back to episode 6. Now, like I always say, if this is the first video that you've seen on this channel before, I really would recommend that you go back to the beginning, start episode 1, and watch these videos in order, because that's how you're going to get the most out of them, you know? Alright, so in this episode, we're just going to pick up right where we left off in the last video, and just continue talking about all the various ways in which we acquire music, and today we're going to mainly be talking about transcribing, and then talk briefly about some other things that will wrap up basically all the things that you could do to acquire material without composing it or creating it yourself, okay? And I talked a little bit about transcribing in the last episode, but that was really just to introduce the topic, because transcribing is such an important part of this topic anyway, but we really didn't talk about it, so that's really what the focus of today is going to be. So let's just get right into it. Now transcribing is one of the most obvious and common answers as far as where to get the musical material from. By definition, transcribing is really just the part that literally involves writing the music down, which I do think is important, but it's really because of what it spawns and everything that comes after that makes transcribing one of the most essential things that we could do for our musical growth. Although I myself had been transcribing for years, as well as practicing playing whatever I was transcribing, at least to the point of it sounding relatively together, I didn't understand my practice process yet. And so what I did with these transcriptions in the past was basically breadcrumbs compared to the entire loaf of bread of work that I do with them now. Now when I say I was transcribing for years, I was half correct. Actually, I was probably the more important half correct, but still only half correct, nevertheless. What I mean is that when I first started transcribing years and years ago, I would write my transcriptions down. Eventually came a period of at least five years, but probably more, where I would learn solos by ear and practice them at least a little bit, you know, work on them, but I wouldn't write them down at all. I think being able to play something properly and have it in the hands, like I've been saying, is definitely more important than just being able to dictate it to paper. However, if you want to be efficient, I can't stress enough the importance of writing things down. Even if you have 100% comprehension of an idea and the ability to play it in the moment, and even if what you would write down would eventually hopefully become memorized if worked through properly, the fact is that being able to write down what you hear so that it's correct, and even has a brief analysis or description for, you know, something like each measure that basically says what's going on and what makes it unique, will create a snapshot of the skillful work that you did to figure out music by ear. And yeah, it shouldn't go to waste, just in case. Most things we learn are definitely forgotten, but you never know when you may want to come back to a forgotten idea, or even a whole slew of ideas that you may have gotten out of a particular transcription. I personally feel that when it comes to internalizing the rhythm of a particular phrase, being able to visualize what it looks like on paper helps a lot. Have you ever been looking at a transcription of something, perhaps more difficult, as you were listening to the same piece of music at the same time and noticed that you can clearly hear all the rhythms that you are looking at on the paper as they are happening? I find this ironic since because when I'm transcribing, I often have to think for oftentimes just a second or sometimes a little bit longer about what rhythm I'm actually hearing. The more experience I get, the easier it gets at deciphering any particular rhythm, but the point I'm making is that even though the rhythms have to be felt internally, if you can dictate a rhythm and understand what it would sound like if you saw what it looked like written down, it'll help a lot. Now, like I said before, a very helpful thing that you can do is include a brief description or analysis under each measure in the transcription. Now, what you may write down will always be unique, but Important things to consider would be the given harmony of the particular measure, any substitutions, upper structures, or implied harmonies that may be utilized, what degree of the basic scale relating to the harmony 
is the phrase starting on if the phrase isn't a continuation from something before. Any important notes that may stick out in the phrase melodically, the shape or contour of the phrase, any unique rhythmic devices, and use of chromatics, etc, etc. For the most part, you're labeling things measure by measure, but everything depends on context. So some things that you may write down could pertain to multiple measures. The interesting thing is, and I think I said something like this in one of the previous episodes, is while I do believe that this is a smart idea, as it adds to the snapshot of the work that you did and your overall understanding, the actual analysis of the phrase, in my opinion, is really not that important. Once the actual ideas are in your hands and in your mind and become usable, the specifics on them become fairly irrelevant. This alludes to the same idea on why you want to practice phrases and musical ideas and not just, you know, scales, arpeggios, and exercises. When you go to improvise, it's not so much about thinking, I'm going to use this chord, scale, or arpeggio over this particular harmony. It should hopefully be something more like this. I'm going to play this phrase or idea over this. This is a small and subtle, but important difference, in my opinion, to making you sound good. Nevertheless, though, you know, you still want to be as thorough as possible when you're in the trenches, as I say, transcribing and doing your analysis and all that. So you still want to be as descriptive and analytical as you can be, because you want to understand the music through and through, just so there's no confusion, you know, later down the road. Now, when selecting things to transcribe, we already said that it's important to select things that you're either drawn to and really want to incorporate into your sound, or you feel are necessary and you should be able to do professionally. Another important thing to consider, though, would be to make sure to not neglect transcribing musicians who play your primary instrument, likely in this case that would be jazz guitar. This is something that I did myself, a little bit. I definitely transcribed jazz guitar solos before, but more often I was drawn to the solos of musicians playing other instruments. And you know, this was in terms of stuff like the types of phrases that they may have been playing and what I thought I wanted to sound like. I'm by no means saying, you know, don't transcribe Charlie Parker or not to try and figure out and incorporate some of Coltrane's incredible ideas. But here's the thing, just like there's a tradition in jazz in general that most jazz musicians appreciate taking the time to study and learn and incorporate into their playing, there is simultaneously a smaller sub-tradition of jazz guitar specifically, or whatever your instrument is, that is still of great importance to study, you know, if, it, uh, if it's been neglected. You don't have to study all of it if you don't want to, or really any of it at all if you don't really care about playing jazz guitar. But learning things that originally come from the same instrument that you play will usually tend to be of more readily available practical use to you, as the ideas are obviously usually more conducive to playing the guitar. This may seem obvious to some people, but the thing is, Many people are often memorized not only by the playing of someone like Charlie Parker, but also the reputation in that, you know, a lot of people who may think they know a little bit about jazz, but maybe not as much as they think, they may think like, oh, that's what I have to learn in order to be able to sound like I can play jazz. I gotta learn to play Charlie Parker because he's like the godfather of modern jazz. You have to first feel comfortable playing easier things that lay well on the guitar and are more easily malleable before trying to play too many complex things, even if you think those things are your sound. Now there's some obvious exceptions to what I'm saying here. An example would be something like learning the Miles Davis So What solo first versus, you know, learning some crazy George Benson solo, you know, you'll get a lot more as a beginner out of learning the Miles solo than George Benson at first, but hopefully you understand my point. There's endless valuable information to be gained that will help you as a jazz guitarist from learning the solos of people like Grant Green, Charlie Christian, Kenny Burrell, 
Wes Montgomery, Joe Pass, Jim Hall, George Benson, Barney Kessel, and many others. To give you an example of an old transcription that I wrote out, I want you to check out here the first three courses of Wes Montgomery's classic solo on D natural blues. The solo actually does go into double time feel later in the solo, but I wrote the transcription out here in double time feel as it'll be a lot easier to decipher than if it was written at the original tempo for these choruses. And for those of you who don't understand what I mean, basically if the first measure is like D7 in like the original tempo or time of the tune, to write it out in double time would mean to write it out in as if it was two longer measures of D7. Now, obviously, this was done by hand. When I do my own transcriptions, this is what I do. There's going to be a lot of PDFs. A lot of what I'll give you will be, you know, digital files that will all include tabs as well. But I don't do that when I do my own transcriptions. And I will offer you guys some of my own transcriptions on my website and everything if you're interested. But, uh, but they're always going to be handwritten. But I'm doing this here just so you can kind of get an idea of how it's done when I'm writing them out and how I have the analysis underneath. And I know that it's chicken scratch that you're probably looking at here, but um, again, it, this one is just meant to give you an idea, basically. But you know what? If you like this solo as well, at least I'm giving you a free one here. I think I'll actually include a link to the actual PDF in the description. Now, for anyone who is more of a beginner to playing jazz or who feels that transcribing is a very difficult or tedious process, I would say to start simple and small. The absolute first thing that anyone would do if they needed to would be to start with basic intervals and ear training. If you feel okay at that, then try transcribing simple things. It's really just trial and error and having the determination to see the process through. The more you do, the less error you'll have and the process will get easier and easier, but you must keep trying. And you know, this would be a good opportunity, I guess, to plug this service that I have as well. On my website, you know, I have private lessons, obviously, but I also do specifically transcription tutoring. And if you're lazy or if you feel like your skills are really not up to par yet, but there's something that you really want to be part of playing, I will potentially transcribe something for you depending on what that is, but you can find more information about that on my website. But, you know, I really do believe that if you really want to be a competent jazz musician, it's pretty much an essential you know, skill that you must have as a jazz musician. Because if you don't have the ability to figure out the specific music that you like, then you'll never really be able to develop, you know, the true musician or artistic voice that, you know, really resonates with, within you inside. So yeah, you know, if you feel like you're someone who really has a hard time with transcribing right now, and you feel like you may want some tutoring, you know, you might want to look into that. And trust me, once you start transcribing and you actually start figuring out the stuff that you've always loved, you're going to be so glad that you uh, really took the initiative to get better at it. Now, I just also want to point out that you want to make sure to also be transcribing chordal ideas as well. Obviously, polyphony is harder to hear than single notes at first, so it may not be the thing to start with. There really is no difference between, you know, single notes and chordal ideas, even if the chordal ideas are usually being used in different contexts. They are both just material that need to be worked on in essentially the same manner. So what this means is that if transcribing is important and crucial for learning how to improvise jazz solos, it is also crucial for learning how to do all the things that you would do with chords in a jazz context. This also may seem obvious, but there's lots of people who are learning jazz who often not only neglect working on comping altogether, but also because of this, they approach comping even more than their soloing as if they were just going to go for it. Because they think that if they know any voicings that 
match the harmony of the tune at that moment, it will be correct if it's in time. And also, they may think that comping is simpler than soloing, so perhaps the ideas don't really need to be worked out beforehand as extensively. Even I myself was aware of things like voice leading for years, and it's not like I never employed it, but I didn't fully comprehend yet what needed to be worked on in order to be solid with it. The truth is, there are musical ways of putting usually practical voicings together that need to be learned and internalized. Now, I myself oftentimes gather this type of material from some of the compositional techniques that I use and will show you in the videos to come, you know, utilizing a song to basically compose different sorts of comping ideas, but I want to point out that you also can and should get a lot of your comping ideas from transcription as well. So if you want to play jazz convincingly, this shouldn't be neglected. I will transcribe a chordal idea, typically if the idea sounds like something that is different from what I normally do, you know, and sounds like something that sounds good to me and something that I would want to play. You know, I just wanted to demo an example for you guys really quickly that pertains to what I'm talking about here. This is a transcription that I did of some of Jim Hall's comping behind Art Farmer on Stompin' at the Savoy. This is a great recording, by the way, and uh, I heard it, I liked what he was doing on it, and when I learned it and saw what it actually was that he was playing, it's just like I was saying before. Pretty much everything that he's using is coming from stock shapes and the way it relates to the basic harmony is very straightforward. Sometimes you might play these little three string voicings that are still stock, they just may be omitting the root, you know, and I'm going to include the transcription to this in my store as well as on Patreon, tabs included, and usually when I do chordal stuff like this, if you happen to check it out, I label the harmony on top of the measures as far as like the basic harmony is concerned because I think it's good to just see it like that and then when you see what the actual voicings are that he's using um, you could see how they relate to the basic harmony and use their harmonic knowledge to basically figure out why the voicing is correct so yeah I think you guys will like this a lot check it out let me know what you guys think Now, I must admit, even though I was rambling about writing things down before, when it comes to the chordal things, I don't always write down um, the chordal things that I either transcribe or compose, but, uh, but sometimes, even if I am going to write things out, it's more about sort of memorizing like a sequence of voicings, even if the rhythm is part of the idea as well. Uh, I just sort of, you know, memorize chordal things more by shapes, and plus, uh, when we do get into more of the compositional ideas, you'll see how I kind of write down and label the different chordal ideas, you know, more with words and sort of a semantical labeling versus like just writing down what the actual music is. And it gives me sort of a more applicable sort of labeling in my head of, oh, you could do this over this, but I've already said too much. We'll worry about that when we get to that. Okay, so I just want to wrap up this video and this section of this topic of gathering your ideas from external sources, basically, by briefly just talking about any other type of thing that you may get, you know, material from. And I'm mainly referring to different types of educational books and videos, perhaps. Many books, as well as videos these days, unlike my videos, can serve as 
excellent resources for lines, musical concepts, chordal sequences, transcriptions, and other valuable musical material to work on. At the end of the day, it's like I keep saying, it really just comes down to figuring out exactly what you want to play and sound like. So wherever the source of inspiration comes from, make sure whatever the example is, it sounds exactly like something that you would want to play. Be discerning with this. This is why people will often tell you to learn from recordings more so than things like books. Because typically, it's the actual music that we all love that we actually all want to sound like, more or less. There are plenty of worthy musical ideas to be found in books and videos, for sure. I'm just saying, don't take an example out of a book or a video just because it happens to be a book or video or an example on a particular thing that you may be trying to develop. If it sounds just okay to you, or you flat out just don't like that example for that particular thing at all, then don't use it. Don't bother with it. If you like the chord melody passage that Kenny Burrell played somewhere better than all the examples in your entire book on chord melody, throw the book away and learn the Kenny Burrell. Ultimately, it comes down to using good judgment to figure out what sounds proper to you and what doesn't. And despite what I just said, there's also books like the classic Charlie Parker Omni book, of course, which are classic holy grails that should not be passed up. Especially if you are in those more beginner stages and maybe you know how to read music, but you do have a hard time transcribing. Again, I say start transcribing as soon as possible, but I can understand why we all can't transcribe Charlie Parker right away, but we can read his music and start practicing it right away. There's nothing wrong at all with learning a solo off a piece of sheet music, so long as you understand that you also need to know how to be able to learn them by ear. All right, so that's about it for today's video. I can't wait to see what this looks like when it's edited down because I had a hard time talking today. You guys never see it because you only see the finished product, but you know, why do I even tell you guys this all the time? You don't care. But anyway, uh, that's about it. So we're gonna continue this topic in the next video. Uh, and we're gonna start talking about compositional stuff and now we're really gonna start to get into some cool things because this really involves stuff that we're actually doing now to generate music. We're still not practicing it yet, but we're doing it now. So look at us. We've come a long way. So if you have any questions, please let me know or any comments, anything at all. If you liked it, I would appreciate giving the video a like. Maybe consider subscribing, consider contributing to Patreon, and if you think anyone else would enjoy my content, please share it with others as well. So that's it, and I'll see you guys in episode 7, lucky number 7. Swinging and playing the blues. That's what we're we about.